Hello, everyone. Let's talk about muscle spindles, which are receptors that are located in skeletal muscles. Here in the middle, I've drawn a quick sketch of a skeletal muscle. If you cut one open and look inside, you'll find these muscle spindles. Now, the number of muscle spindles vary depending on what muscle it is, but there can be hundreds of muscle spindles in a single skeletal muscle belly. When you are moving about, they send information about that muscle's length to the central nervous system so that your brain could coordinate your movements. If you know an instrument, you'll probably have noticed how you can sometimes play an entire song without needing to look down at your hands. Well, muscle spindles have an important role to play in this ability. You may be asking, why is muscle length even that important to movement coordination? Well, here I've drawn an example of a movement that we should all be familiar with, which is the extension and flexion of your forearm. From previous classes, you may know that there are two main muscles that are involved in this movement, which is the bicep on the top and the triceps on the bottom. Together, they are an antagonistic muscle pair. During extension, the bicep is relaxed and lengthened, while the triceps is contracted and shortened. In contrast, when you flex your forearm, the bicep is contracted while the triceps is relaxed. So you can see how your brain can use muscle length information sent by the muscle spindles within your bicep and triceps to tell whether your forearm is extended or flexed without you having to actually look. There are two types of length information that muscle spindles pick up on. First, the rate of change in length. Keep in mind that both of these types of information are about length. The rate of change in muscle length is about the speed at which a muscle is stretched. So from our previous example, this type of information allows the brain to know how fast our forearm is being extended or flexed. The second type of information is absolute length. This is about the actual length of the muscle. How long or short is the muscle right now? For example, if the bicep is longer than the triceps, your brain knows that your forearm is extended. In order to detect these two different types of information, muscle spindles are comprised of different sensory nerve fibers. You may know that receptors send information to your central nervous system by firing action potentials. While well, sensory receptors are capable of adapting to constant stimuli by decreasing the amount of signals it is sending to the brain. So, for detecting rate of change, you have phasic rapid adapting receptors. These adapt very quickly to constant stimuli, and their action potentials immediately slow down as soon as a stimulus becomes constant. For absolute length, you have tonic, slow adapting receptors. These receptors adapt slowly, so they will keep firing action potentials at a high rate even when the stimulus has been constant for some time. The more the muscle is stretched, the greater its rate of firing action potentials. If you want to learn more about the differences between tonic and phasic receptors, you can check out my other video where I go more in depth about how they differ in firing action potentials. For now, we are going to take a look at the components of a muscle spindle. In each muscle spindle, which I've drawn here in blue, there are several non-contractile intrafusal muscle fibers. If I take one muscle spindle out of a skeletal muscle and look inside, I'll find two types of intrafusal muscle fibers. By the way, if you are wondering about what extrafusal muscle fibers are, in contrast to intrafusal muscle fibers, they are actually just the muscle fibers on the outside that do all of the contracting. The two types of intrafusal muscle fibers are called nuclear bag fiber and nuclear chain fiber. The nuclear bag fiber is usually represented like this. And the bag-like structure here is actually where a lot of cell nuclei are concentrated. There is usually only one nuclear bag fiber found in each muscle spindle. In contrast, the nuclear chain fiber is normally depicted like this. 
and its nuclei are not concentrated in a single area like those of nuclear bag fibers. You can usually find several of these nuclear chain fibers per muscle spindle. With each intrafusal muscle fiber inside a muscle spindle, there are sensory neurofiber innervations. These are the tonic and phasic sensory fibers that I had mentioned previously. They innervate the individual intrafusal muscle fibers, and the innervation differs for each type of muscle fiber. For both nuclear bag and nuclear chain fibers, a phasic sensory neurofiber called the group 1A fiber wraps around the center of the muscle fiber. On the other hand, the tonic group 2 fibers, or flower spray fibers, only wrap around the ends of the nuclear chain fibers. It is important that they are at the ends, because even though I had previously said that the intrafusal muscle fibers are non-contractile, they do have two small contractile regions which, you might have guessed, are at the ends of the fiber. In order for this region to contract, gamma motor neurons also innervate these contractile regions on both types of intrafusal muscle fibers. So, to recap, nuclear bag fibers have phasic group 1A fibers innervating the non-contractile region in the middle, and efferent gamma motor neurons innervating the contractile ends. Nuclear chain fibers have both of these things, but in addition, they also have tonic group 2 fibers innervating the contractile ends. It's very important for these intrafusal muscle fibers to have contractile ends. I'm going to illustrate that with these diagrams here at the bottom. The two structures on the outside are actually extrafusal muscle fibers, and I've drawn it in red to match my previous diagram at the top. The structure on the inside, you might have guessed, is an intrafusal muscle fiber. I've drawn a single nuclear bag fiber for clarity, but usually this, along with several other nuclear chain fibers, would be inside a muscle spindle. I've just chosen to leave those all out. I'll now add the group 1A fiber innervation in the middle of this muscle fiber. Now, let's see what happens as you move and walk throughout the day. Your muscles might stretch as you're moving about. As your extrafusal muscle fibers stretch, it also pulls on the intrafusal muscle fibers, which stimulates the sensory receptors. There is no problem here. Your sensory receptors will be able to feel that the intrafusal muscle fibers are being stretched, and the action potential firing rate will increase. Now let's see what happens when you contract your muscles. The extrafusal muscles contract, which pushes and in a way slightly compacts the intrafusal muscle fiber. This causes the sensory innervations around the intrafusal muscle fiber to go limp. The problem here is that if the sensory nerve fibers are slack, it won't be able to feel any further contractions or minute extensions while it's slack. The best analogy I can think of is hair. And this example works a little better if you have longer hair. Take one strand of hair or a small section of hair and hold it out so that it's extended straight out. Gently pull on your hair and you'll be able to feel a slight pull on your scalp. This is like your muscles during extension. Now hold your hair so that it is limp in the middle and try to gently pull on your hair. Not to the extent that it's completely extended, but so that it's still slack you won't be able to feel anything on your scalp. That's what happens to your muscles when they contract. Your body overcomes this problem with something called the alpha-gamma coactivation. Remember those contractile ends of intrafusal muscle fibers? They contract as the extrafusal muscle fibers contract, which effectively keeps the sensory innervations taut by maintaining a bit of stretch in the intrafusal muscle fibers. This might be difficult to understand at first, so let's take a closer look. Here's a single nuclear bag fiber by itself. I've highlighted the contractile ends. When these ends contract, you can see how this also simultaneously pulls the middle non-contractile region outwards. 
This keeps the sensory innervations from going slack, which allows you to keep receiving information about small extensions and contractions while your muscle is contracted.